Yeah, I'm really excited. I, you know, was so grateful to have an early essay from uh, this forthcoming book of uh, essays published in AQR. Um, and I, tonight, I'm going to read um, a small section from the introduction uh, to give you kind of a greater um, kind of foundation for what this book is and is trying to do. Um, and although, yes, I am a poet, um, I won't be reading my own poems, but there will be plenty of poems and ideas about poems in this introduction. We all seek patterns, but neurodivergent individuals tend to seek them out with a combination of knack and urgency that is startling and not coincidental. In 2014, Camilla and Henry Markram posited the intense world theory which explores the way autistic neurology is characterized by ways of processing the world that are both uniquely dynamic and uniquely complex. They posited that autistic minds aren't under-resourced, as was often considered to be the case, but over-connected. They noted that the fabric of autistic brain circuitry is much more dense and ornate than in the general population. This is one key to understanding why many young children seem to regress into autism around two or three years old, just at the time when most young brains are beginning to prune neurons away for a more streamlined set of connections. The abundance of connectivity often leads to synesthetic experiences of the world, hearing colors or tasting sounds, but it can also create a sort of cognitive and perceptual feedback the bandwidth too wide to be processed amid the chaos of neurotypical life. If, as intense world theory argues, we think of the autistic brain as being like a supercomputer, we can begin to understand how crucial context, how crucial context and environment are to the success of that processing potential. Denizens of the intense world desire a means to tune out sensory feedback and tune in the deep focus of perception turning intensity from foe to friend. Though it's clear that this vocabulary of processing can be useful, I also wanna push back a little on the neuroreductive objectification this supercomputer metaphor can engender. For it threatens once again to obscure the essential humanness of autistic experience. When I'm with my students, I'm not thinking of them as anything but the lovely humans that I see before me. We relate to each other as friends, trusting that we're each there to listen and learn, to extend kindnesses and generosities that befit our ever evolving fellowship. So while neurological frameworks may be helpful in conceptualizing autistic cognition, teaching is something entirely different. It's two humans sitting with each other, looking to connect, watching for meaning in movement listening for moments in language that resonate and exhilarate. One of my students, Sid Ghosh, a non-speaking autist with Down syndrome, offers us a more natural metaphor for autistic intensity. I'll read Sid's poem, Volcanic Mind. Humming friends, torque screw language into my mining mind. Mind secretes modes of intense lava. Lava makes own path. Fire forges mind. To think mind is hot is to hammer bones with air. For Sid, forging mind is an intense and ongoing process, one that can be helped along by humming friends who torque screw language. Tuning in allows Sid to secrete the raw material of thought, which then seeks its own paths. Sid hears birds and they prompt the forge of his mind. He hears humming words hammering on his ear bones with air. As friends ask a question or read his last line aloud, and this humming stokes his internal heat, allowing him to forge his own way with language, accessing the abundant treasure that exists there. Even then, however, 
this treasure may need a mold to pour itself into, a form that can hold its immense value and shape. This is where poetry comes in. I believe the sensuous patterns and dynamic formal possibilities of poetry are uniquely designed to help autists translate aspects of their intense multidimensional thought into linguistic expression. Poems carry the dynamism embodied in movement, mining, forging, hammering. Poems and patterns help organize the innate movement of the body into thought, initiating a complex dance that one of my students, Aman Bukela, calls motioning truth. And again, I think it's important to note that this process of motioning truth isn't unique to autists. Through routine, habit, predilection, we all summon the patterns that help us grasp our own truths and meet the challenge of any moment. But those challenges, especially for many of my autistic students, feature a bracing combination of sensory intensity and motor perplexity that can set the world swirling. No wonder then, that they move so often toward the anchor pattern provides. In his poem, I Use Patterns to Survive, non-speaking autist Chaitan Januru advises the reader, feel it and follow it. He continues, my life follows a pattern of many other autistics, so I learn from them. Our lives are products of invincible codes that create invincible patterns. I write and update them. I design and fuel them into real life circumstances and add simplicity to educate myself. To feel and follow the pattern is to educate yourself. So many of the autists I know are autodidacts and like so much that we do in life for ourselves, by ourselves, outside of any school or tuition, this kind of self-education is largely an act of intuition. We move deep inside our antenna body, feeling our way through the flesh and texture of an abundant world toward the focus of frequency, seeking above all else a sense of attunement. Instead of memorizing facts to prepare for some uncertain future life, we become autodidacts of the now a manifold of objects and creatures and perceptions that call us into perception. This is the dance Adam writes about so vibrantly. I mentioned Adam earlier in the introduction. A flow made possible by our abiding relation to a nearly impossible world so bursting it is with sensory detail. Patterns help us tune in to the inherent sim simplicity we seek, a wayfaring line amid the spectacular chaos of contemporary life. They move us from the babbling patter of life, as Adam would say, to the pattern of it, tuning in to meaningful ways of moving and languaging. Though these patterns arise differently for each person, there are overlaps, a confluence of ways in which we begin to find commonality. Poems can be a meeting ground where we share our complementary experiences of the world. Poems and patterns can ground us and the commons of our overlapping ground can be a place where we grow consensual neurodiverse futures. Or to borrow a neologism from Hannah Emerson, another student of mine, poems are where we can ground ourselves and ground here is spelled G-R-O-W-N-D. So you have both grow and ground coming together. This word is born from her observation that to authentically reach, one must also authentically root. In her writing, as you'll see, Hannah creates a pattern of roots and reaches to hold her phrases, which often begin with an anaphoric please and end with the doubled yes of her joyful epistrophe. This is a poem by Hannah Emerson called Hannah is never only Hannah. Please get that I am the trying breeze going through the really great, great, great world. Yes, yes. Please get that I am the drowning helpful freedom of the storm. Yes, yes. Please get that I am the very hot, great, 
great, great son. Yes, yes. Please get that I am the great, 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 great ice that gives you the freeze you need to get to melt into nothing. Yes, 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 yes. Please get that I am the sky, great, 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 blue, nothing, yes, yes. Please get that I am the ground, great, great, great place, helping you, helping you stand in grateful, helpful, 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 kissing her, 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 yes. Please get that you and I greet the great, great life from this place of great, great kissing, life, 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 yes, yes, yes. Please get that you are great form, great formless, helping, kissing, kissing, great, knowing the great, 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 helpful, kissing the trying, yes, yes. Please get that helpful, loving, thinking you help, just help, kissing, helpful, loving, great, great, great world turn upside down. Yes, yes. Please get that you help me by helping me turn upside down too. Yes, yes, yes. Please get that great, great, helpful kissing people need to get that great, helpful kissing is turning kissing upside down. Yes, yes. Please get that helpful kissing just needs to be gathered into this helpful kissing, trying hell of this life to go forward to help me, Hannah, 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 yes, yes. Please get that you need loving kissing to make you like me, yes, yes. Please get that the kissing must be great nodding of you, me, great, us, together in this hell, yes, yes, yes. Please get that you kiss me, helping me kiss you, yes, yes. Whew. This wasn't the first time Hannah had used the neologism ground, and so I was prepared when she spelled it that way. I had also encountered her repetitions of great and yes, as well as her use of the anaphoric please. These patterns had accrued in her work poem by poem. Our previous sessions and all the conversations about pattern and language they entailed formed the ground for my listening. These exchanges are true to Hannah's vision, asking and affirming, assuring the reader a consensual space where our ways can cross and not and kiss. You may occasionally feel turned upside down when encountering these poems, thrown into a momentary disequilibrium. Motioned truth can throttle even the most seasoned reader, but hell is sometimes where we must begin. There is great solace in beginning there together, a multiplication of greats that help ground us in the simple grace of being gathered, of the possibility of belonging to each other. And the reciprocity intrinsic to that project of belonging, you kiss me, helping me kiss you, is what draws us into the multi-directional flow of expression. For a time, Hannah began each phrase with the word keep. She was insistent that we must keep each other in the flow and in the light. It was in this context that she revealed the term she uses for poets, keepers of the light. Those committed to cultivate and keep the illuminations we need. In this phrase, I hear the echoes of poet activist Audre Lorde, who wrote, poetry is not a luxury. It is a vital necessity of our ex existence. It forms the quality of light within which we predicate our hopes and dreams toward survival and change. In and against the consistent imposition of fear and silence, we must seek the illuminative means to see and sing. And it mattered to Lord that we seek it together, even or especially across difference without ever minimizing or alighting those differences. Hannah and I couldn't agree more, believing that these lights are nothing if not shared, that the light only exists in fact. 
when it leaps forth in the space between us and becomes a bridge we keep together. Or as Lord wrote, poetry is not only dream and vision, it is the skeleton architecture of our lives. It lays the foundation for a future of change, a bridge across our fears of what has never been before. Thank you very much.